Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who've seen the family, we do ask to please be seated. We want everybody to have an opportunity to see the family. We welcome those of you who are joining us via live stream for the funeral of Philip C. Zagon. We are humbled to have the military honors for Phil, the United States Air Force. So at this time, we're going to begin the military honors. Following that, Rabbi Karen Kadar, Phil's rabbi, will be officiating. We'll be starting with uh, cutting the ceremony, or having the ceremony of Kriya, and then beginning the sacred funeral ceremony. If you haven't done this already, please be sure that your phones have been turned off. behalf of the President of the United States, 
the United States Army and a grateful nation. Please accept this flag as a symbol of our appreciation for your loved one's honorable and faithful service. Morning. As we tear the ribbon, we say that uh, if this were to the ribbon, our hearts are torn. Very often, we try to Beginning with military honors is so fitting for a man who stood with life with such dignity. And we will talk a little bit about his service as time goes on. But now we turn to our tradition, an ancient tradition in times when our hearts are broken. We turn to the Psalms. Esainai el harim me ayin yavo ezri, I lift my eyes to the mountains. What is the source of my help? Ezrime im Adonai, Oseh Shemaim Va'aretz, my help comes from God, who is the maker of heaven and earth. God will not let your foot give way. The protector will not slumber. See, the protector of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is your guardian at your right hand. The 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In this beautiful psalm we read that as we sit in the valley of shadows, what pursues us, what follows us all the days of our life is goodness and mercy.
in the rising of the sun and its going down, we will remember him. In the blowing of the wind and the chill of winter, we will remember him. In the opening of the buds and the rebirth of spring, we will remember him. In the rustling of the leaves and the beauty of autumn, we will remember him. At the beginning of the year and when it ends, we will remember him. And when you are weary and in need of strength, you will remember him. And when you are lost and sick at heart, you will remember him. When you have joys you yearn to share, you will remember him. As long as we live, he lives in our memories and our thoughts and our stories, always a part of us, and we will always remember him. In the book of Job, it says, Adonai Natan, Adonai Lakach, Yihishem, Adonai Mevorach. God is given, God is taken away. Blessed be the name of God. We are an ancient people, well acquainted with grief and the shadows. Death and sorrow are not strangers to us, yet the centuries have taught this, that a good name endures beyond the grave. And he had a good name. And that there is strength in faith. So now we say with Job, Adonai Natan, God, you have given us a loved one who will never be forgotten. And for everything that was good and enduring in his life, we offer the deeper thanks of our hearts. Adonai Lakach, and God, you have taken away. We pray for strength to turn our broken hearts into an altar of trust. And we will say, Yehi Shem Adonai Mivorach, blessed be the name of God now and forever. We sat together, a small handful of us, yesterday, telling a lot of stories, remembering a lot of beautiful vignettes. And these stories, of course, do not end and cannot be all told right now. It's lifelong, the lifting of the stories and of the memories. But for now, for a tribute right this moment, Phil's children want to come forth, and then his grandchildren want to come forth. So I ask the children to come first, forth first, Karen and Lori and Glenn. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as you know, our dad retired from Zagan Business Service, but he never stopped working, learning, and helping others. He just recently called my sister to make sure to call a customer, a printing customer, to make sure he got his invoice and his printing was delivered. He never stopped working. When I exhibited, and I, I'm just going to show you, I have really small notes here, so I'm going to be really fast. When I exhibited at a local trade show with, you know, my old job, Gina and Tammy, you can hear this, um, Dad was always there helping me. Um, he took the train to Union Station from Northbrook to sit at a table with me promoting the North Shore. He was one of our, our highest supporters living in Northbrook as well. The Chamber of Business Expo was his favorite event every year. He enjoyed talking to people. Friends now to this day have told me that now they know where I got my niceness from after meeting him. So I take that as a high compliment. The recent times that we've had, and again, we, we all know what a wonderful man he was and how much we all loved him, and he loved all of you. But the last recent times that we spent at Glenbrook Hospital, just getting treatments and taking him back and forth to various doctor's appointments. I, I really listened and got to talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, and I really value that time where no spouses, children, grandchildren, no offense, children, but we all, we had some really good, and he listened to my stories. He said he liked my stories about the restaurant that I work in now, and it was just something to pass the time, something 
to deviate from what we were going through. But he did listen, and I told him just a few days ago, I'm still going to be telling you my stories, because no one else will listen but him. <laughs> so I want to treasure the memories that we have and the lessons that he shared with us as growing up and as adults and with our own families. And every single day, Dad told me, love you, baby, every day, person on the phone. And I, of course, told him I loved him because you never know when your last time's going to be, so we didn't take any chances. And the other thing he told us, especially these last few weeks, was thanks for coming. And that was something that was a given that, of course, where, where else would we be? But he, he, we love him, and we want him to just rest well. Um, and really fast, I want to thank our wonderful caregivers. Mr. P was Alicia and Pierre those last few weeks, and Delia and Angie. Uh, you've been so wonderful to our family, and you are now part of our family, as we told you. So you're stuck with us <laughs> and mom. Of course. Um, and I just wanted to tell my dad that um, because he was very concerned about the People magazines that came in every week, that I brought the People magazine, and I will continue bringing the People magazine. So don't worry. We will take care of them <laughs> and, and share them. He wanted us to share. So thank you for listening, and thank you all for being here. And thank you all for coming. So after Dad retired, uh, he joined the GEL group, which is Gentlemen's Enjoying Leisure Activities. And he went uh, and really enjoyed all of the, the GEL activities. Um, I'm going to share with you some of his um, creative writing from his class. He never let us read what he wrote uh, or what he was working on, um, but sorry, Dad, we found the folder um, of these wonderful treasures. And along with the, all the true events um, of his life, he also wrote fiction. He wrote about space travel. He wrote about being a professional athlete. He wrote about interviewing US presidents, even Trump. Um, and he even wrote an Academy Award acceptance speech. <laughs> Matthew, I will have to share that with you. Um, all from his perspective. I wish he wrote about the time that he flew to LA to uh, try out as a contestant on Wheel of Fortune, but that's a story for another time. So I read these stories last night for the first time. Some written um, on the back, this is one, written on the back of all of his Sports Lodge um, extra paper. Um, he still was always into, always recycle, repurpose, and reuse. So I remember one of these events uh, vividly, but I was fascinated to hear from his perspective. So Karen was 10, I was 5, Glenn, I don't know, do the math. Three. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so in Dad's own words, I want to share with you one of his stories, and it's entitled, My First Pet. Mom, I'm sure you will remember this. My wife and I were to attend a parent-teacher conference at, her, at my daughter's school. Of course, we would go and support. Um, and sitting at the rear, rear of the room in a tight school desk, the teacher asked uh, all the assembled parents a series of questions to get the feel of their child's home life. One by one, the teacher asked each parent what type of pet was part of their family. A parrot, a dog, a cat, a ferret and on and on until the question was raised to us. Being honest and forthright, we replied, we do not have a pet of any kind in our home. All eyes turned from the front of the room to us, staring with disapproval, anger, disgust, disappointment of being unworthy of parenthood to deny your children the excitement of bonding with a pet. I felt humiliated that we were the only parents that did not have a pet for our children. So a friend of mine who owned a farm nearby told me that one of his dogs had a litter and I could have one of those puppies at no charge. Well, boy, that was the deal I could not refuse. So I arranged to pick up the puppy, brought him home, home in a corrugated box to the dismay of my wife, who was not in agreement to bring home a puppy, let alone without her permission. So I was forced to sleep on the couch in our small family room downstairs 
with the puppy 20 feet away in the nearby kitchen. All night, the puppy squealed, cried, barked, made all kinds of noises that everyone heard it all over the house. Needless to say, my wife gave me an ultimatum to either return the puppy to my friend's farm or start looking for a new address for me to live. <laughs> After that episode, we never had another pet in our home, although now my grown three children have dogs of various sizes and breeds. So these were a real treasure. So thank you, Dad. We'll be um, publishing those stories soon. <laughs> thank you. I'm the youngest child. Um, um, you know, when you say my dad's name, you just say Phil Zagon. I think the unanimous response is, wow, Phil, what a great guy. Um, everyone loved our dad. His family was the center of, of his universe, and his presence was a constant source of strength and reassurance for all of us. He taught my sisters and I the true meaning of love through his actions, always putting our needs before his own and showing us that caring for one another was the greatest gift of all. Um, our dad was a proud Chicagoan. He grew up in Humble Park. He would always tell stories of the old neighborhood. He was a huge Cub fan and a, a huge Bears fan as well. Even as late as last week, we were talking about the Bears. And while he had a difficult time speaking, he whispered to me, he said, Glenner, the only way to fix the Bears is to hire a new coach and get all new players. <laughs> and I was like, well said, Dad. That, that's perfect. <laughs> I, I used to call him before every game, and he'd say, I can't talk right now. I'm on my way to the airport. I'm coaching the Bears. <laughs> and if they lost, it would kind of ruin his day. He really had a rough day. But he always bounded, or bounced back uh, very quickly. He used to always take uh, my sisters and I to Cub games. He taught us important le life lessons like disappointment <laughs> and how to fill in a, a good scorecard. He always bought a bag of peanuts outside the stadium, and we'd enter the gates of Wrigley Field, and it was truly the, the best. I can't even describe how great it was. My, my sisters and I had the privilege of taking him to one last Cubs game in September, and it really was the perfect day, and, uh, and they won that game as well. A lot of people don't know this, but our dad also invented Costco before there was a Costco. <laughs> he was a king of purchasing large quantities of household items like Colgate toothpaste, Kleenex, tinfoil, and his favorite, Tide Pods. And he would stockpile those in his garage. He called it the warehouse. And anytime we visited, we'd ask if the warehouse was open, and he'd say with a big smile, sorry, we're closed. <laughs> and then he'd give you whatever you want. And I don't think I've ever bought a box of Kleenex in my life. <laughs> he was also very proud of his culinary pursuits, especially tuna salad. I never had the stomach to actually watch him make it. But let's just say he would put things in that tuna that had no right being together. <laughs> and although it was tough to swallow, I'm really going to miss that tuna. My dad opened a printing company. It was named Zagon Business Service in 1961. My mom worked by his side for over 50 years, and my sisters and I worked there, as well as my cousins, during school breaks. He made it a fun place to work, and he always included a good lunch. I'm sure he lost money when we all worked there, <laughs> but he was happy to have us, just to have us around. His customers and employees loved him. He taught us how to treat people with honesty, respect, and be true to your word. He was a true mensch. For my dad, a handshake meant really meant something. And if Phil Zagon said he was going to do something, he did it, whether it benefited him or not. And he was also involved deeply in the community. His leadership and passion for making a difference was evident in his dedication to B'nai B'rith and Sports Lodge, where he volunteered his time and efforts to various philanthropic endeavors for over 50 years. Um, my dad showed us that family is everything and that a little humor can brighten the darkest of days. His big smile would brighten any room, and our family and friends loved talking and just hanging out with him. He was our rock, our comedian, our mentor, and our Costco-loving bargain hunter, <laughs> all rolled into one. He was an extraordinary man who we were all so fortunate to call dad. 
Thank you. Matthew and the grandchildren, I guess you're all coming up. Good afternoon. Um, I will be speaking and then I know Hannah has some words as well. Um, today as we honor the one and only Phil Zagon, you've heard and are going to hear many wonderful stories about him being an amazing husband, father, friend, but I have the distinct honor to be one of the few people who get to describe him as grandpa. I stand here speaking for all of his grateful grandkids, including myself, Sydney, Ben, Hannah, and our dearly departed Sarah. When people say that our grandpa was the kindest and most generous man on the planet, few people knew it better than us. From childhood to adulthood, the love was always there and unconditional. And I will be the first to admit, like all kids, we made it hard sometimes. Uh, but even when Ben and I were causing the type of chaos that only two young boys could cause, or when Sydney or Hannah would cry at fireworks or scary movie trailers, Grandpa was always there to calm us down to make us feel better. He would often do this by being his typical goofball self. And when I tell you that nobody could make us laugh more than Grandpa, I really mean it. I once described it as him having my funny bone on speed dial. Even when he wasn't trying to be funny, he was funny. But he was also an incredibly kind and gentle human being. And of course, generous doesn't even begin to describe him. He was the master of what Sydney and I eventually titled the grandpa handshake, which was of course a regular handshake as, but as we were saying goodbye, but somehow he would manage to slip a $20 bill or something similar in your hand before you can even realize it. It was something that was never expected by any of us, but always appreciated when it happened. But that was grandpa, the ultimate giver. The memories will always be there from road trips, birthdays, cruise vacations. Each memory with grandpa was a special one. The thing I'll honestly most miss most is just popping by the house to sit and chat for a while, to simply check in with how everything was going. He'd want to know about my theater projects, which he never missed a show, my film projects, school, work, dating, friends, whatever. Whenever I left their house, I always remember thinking how lucky it was that I have a grandfather who cared about every single aspect of my life and really cared, and for that I'll forever be grateful. For myself and the other grandkids, we lost the head of our family. The head of the table will never look quite the same at family events without Grandpa sitting there. But for all of the sadness that today brings, I know he'd want us to think about the memories that make us smile. Just like when we were kids, when we were feeling sad, we can always count on Grandpa to have a speed dial to our funny bones and our hearts. We love you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm so lucky to have been raised by a grandfather who embodied the qualities of a true role model. My grandpa was not only the kindest soul you could ever meet, but also had an unmatched sense of humor that could brighten even the gloomiest of days. Throughout my childhood, Grandpa always made time for us grandchildren, playing games with us like jail, where we'd, he'd let us tie him up. <laughs> he always liked to play card games, and when you had to pick a card, I remember he used to always go, pick, pick, pick. Um, and visits to the pool where he conducted his exclusive water aerobics class, attended solely by the two of us. Um, and if he wasn't hanging out with us grandchildren, you could bet he was in his favorite chair, ready for his daily dose of Judge Judy. Um, one of my favorite memories we have um, is from our road trips that we went on and the iconic and absurd things he would do on them. Like when we checked into a hotel and expecting special treatment, he said, I'm a Marriott Rewards member. And the response was, sir, this is a Hampton Inn. <laughs> um, also, the many shopping trips where he'd tag along with me and Nana. You'd think he was sitting right next to us, and then the next thing you know, he's solo, wandering the mall, or sitting on a bench somewhere, people watching. We'd have to call him at least once to figure out where he was. 
Grandpa was everyone's biggest cheerleader, supportive of everything we did and always willing to give advice. Not only was he the biggest investor in my kombucha, or as he called it, kombuchi business, but every time he'd see a new Arby's commercial, he'd always give me a call and tell me how much he liked it and wanted to try what was being advertised. I loved bringing him over new sandwiches to try and watching him devour it, even if he wasn't thrilled about the price. <laughs> we'll all miss you so much, Grandpa, and we're so glad we got to spend time with such an amazing person like you. Thank you for everything. Vicki, it's so wonderful to know that the children and the grandchildren actually know you. You know, there are so often times that we wonder if our children know who we are, if our grandchildren ever have time for us. And what we witnessed here among the other beautiful tributes was that Phil was completely known by the people that he loved and cared about so much. And that is not to be taken for granted. Well done. So it was around Thanksgiving, I suppose, that Phil decided to live without treatment. And when you told me it was around Thanksgiving, I thought to myself, <clears throat> Thanksgiving, gratitude in an ironic kind of way. Treatment was brutal, but he did it. And he was grateful for the abundance and the blessings of his life. You have a strong, supportive family, you told me. We can get through anything together, you told me. That is great abundance and blessing. Everybody loved dad, you said, and together armed with love, you sat vigil, as you mentioned, during a very precious time. He thanked you, but of course you were there. That's how they were, always there. And so in the time that he needed you, you were, of course, presence. Phil's parents, Ray and Charles, Charles died suddenly of a heart attack at 42. Ray then married Aaron, three siblings. Mickey, although I assume you called him many things over the course of his year, Phil and Renee, Renee, we're so sorry for your loss, and we know how hard it is to be the last sibling. Siblings share stories and experiences that nobody else could possibly understand or remember. And it is now on you, of course, to continue to tell those stories because they want to know, even if you think they've heard them before. They want to know what it was like, and they want to remember, and they want to hear those stories to fill in that gap, to link to that early part of your world. Because he was around 12 when his dad died, he went to work. And my guess is he's been working ever since. Was a soda jerk, delivering newspapers, whatever it took to bring money home. And he met Vicky, a blind date, walking in, are you ready for this image, with blue suede shoes and a rust jacket. <laughs> Vicky's parents were not impressed. <laughs> they went out, they broke up once, Vicky saw the error of her ways and said, no, no, I didn't mean it. And ever since then, they've been together about 66 years. That's incredible. Though he wanted to go to law school, again responding to the reality, and that was, Vicki, your pregnancy with your firstborn, he took his responsibility seriously and went into the pr printing um, business. And you told me about how you and all the cousins worked there. Vicki was his partner. I mean, but really his partner. She did the books. She did the invitations. All of you had your first jobs. You were learned the art of collating and stapling and delivering and became expert proofreaders. 
You had one of the early fax machines. He had a side business with the fax machines. You had an answering service, and that image you told me was amazing. On the shelf, black phones with red buttons. Remember those? And the button would uh, would would enlighten, and you would pick it up and take the message, and then people would come in at the end of the day and say, any message for me? Uh, it's unbelievable what he has seen over the course of his life. Instant print, before there was instant print, mailers, advertisers, the pre-Kinko Kinko. He's, as you said, and I'm going to repeat it, delivering jobs even in the last couple of weeks. Kind of found a way and figured out how to go ahead and do that. Loyal to his customers, and they were loyal to him. Pay your bills first. Your word is your word. A handshake is a handshake. We don't know those things anymore. And they're everything. Your word is your word. A handshake is a handshake. Vicky, by his side, would leave the office at 3 because the children would come home. You never felt alone. Mom was there. And then a little bit later, maybe five, maybe six, dad would come home and he would walk right up to your mother and kiss her and she'd say, what are you kissing me for? You just saw me. And he would say, I missed you. Wow. For you to witness all the days of your life that kind of love and devotion between a mother and a father, to know with all that they loved you, their love together gave you a solid foundation of security and imagination of what life should be and relationship should be. They saved every card, every recital program, every scrap of paper that bared witness to whatever it is that you did in life. They were always present. Every birthday, every bar mitzvah, a scratch pad with your theme or your name on it. Do some of you still have those scratch pads? And that army service, that incredible, elegant, powerful ritual that we witnessed at the beginning of this moment was towards the end of the Korean War. He served, and he at one point was given a choice either to go overseas or to stay at home and learn how to be a paratrooper, that had an extra $50 a month, and he was going to go for the extra $50 a month. Paratrooper. That would mean jumping out of planes. Not sure your mother knew about that at the beginning, but Aaron did. And he was so proud to be part of the 82nd Airborne. He told me a very beautiful, poignant story in about 2018 when he became part of the Honor Flight Chicago, flying, flying from Midway to D.C., where there was a ceremony, meeting with elected officials, probably a senator. And on the plane, they had announced mail call, which was letters that many of you wrote to him, telling him how much he meant to you. Oh, my gosh, what a gift that he was able to be on the plane at one of the highlights of his life. And he had, my guess is, every moment of his life was a highlight. That's how he kind of lived. And to read the letters of the love and admiration of the children, of the cousins. And when he came home, the three of you were there with signs. You showed me some pictures, and I saw that beautiful face of his just as he had been there for you, you were there for him. And today we call it millennials and Gen X, but then we called it the greatest generation. And indeed, he was part of that. That parachuting, jumping off planes served him well, stop, drop, roll. <laughs> so in his older years, when he would draw it, when he would fall, he didn't get hurt usually because he would stop, drop, and roll, and he would be okay. You mentioned Jell, the secret society. I love those manuscripts. Every time you pull, I, I mean, I'm calling them manuscripts. Every time you pull out those those pieces of paper, we don't we delete 
and we save and we change our computers and we lose and we don't have and there's a cloud somewhere. And here you have in your hands his thoughts, his imagination. You mentioned B'nai B'rith, but you didn't mention that he was Midwest regional president. Did I get that right? Incredible. Everybody recognizing his leadership at a dinner that they had, congratulating him. He had the Cousins Club, the Israel Trip Friends, the Friends from Humble Park. Groups and groups of people that the two of you, Vicki, were just always in different circles of friendships. He helped people that you don't even know that he helped. He preferred to trust rather than be cynical. He preferred to give rather than to be suspect. Ask them the time that he lent the car and the title of the car to a kid. <laughs> Vicki, you were the love of his life. Every girl wants to be adored. And you indeed were adored. You were partners in business, in life, in family, and most significantly, in love. He was modest and generous and fun and funny. Never heard the word no come out of his mouth. A largeness of life. And that twinkle in his eye, or as you described, that beautiful smile that lit up the room. And for the last 12 days of his life, you held vigil. You yourselves became living testimony of how fundamental and beautiful it is when you live a life of devotion and love. It came easy for you. It doesn't come easy for many people. And it became easy for you because your family was founded and grew and matured on those beautiful values of devotion and fun and love. So we look at the next generation who he was privileged to see turn into adults. And that's your legacy. That's the whole thing. It seems so simple, and in this complicated world, it is so complicated. But for you, I don't know. I just hope it comes easy. Because that's the people you come from. Love a little bit more. Be a little bit more devoted. And never, ever let go of each other. May his memory be for a blessing. Please rise. Elmele Rachamim, Shochem Baromim, Hametzem, Menucha, Nachona, Tachat Kanfea Shrina, Im Kedoshim, Tohorim, Kazora, Harakia, Masirim, et Nishmat, Phil, Shalach, Olamo, Bal Harachamim, Yesterete, Besetter, Kanafav, Lolamim, Vietzor, Betzor, Chaim, et Nishmato, Adonai, who Nachlato, Vitanuach, the Shalom, Amishkovo, and Omar, Amen, which means compassionate God eternal spirit of the universe. Grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence, for Phil has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in the shadow of your wings, and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace, as we all say. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the interment service will continue at Shalom Memorial Park Cemetery, located at 1700 West Rand Road in Arlington Heights. The family will be together at the Cannon Residence at 801 Danet Road here in Buffalo Grove, following the interment till 8 p.m., then Wednesday from 3 to 8 p.m. Memorial contributions in his memory to the honor flight would be appreciated. 
And for those of you who are joining us via live stream, all that information is on the Funeral Homes website. For those of you who will be driving in the funeral procession to the cemetery, the procession will be forming in our parking lot. Please obtain an orange safety funeral sticker to place on the right hand side of our windshield. Have your bright lights and hazard lights on at all times. For additional measures of safety, we will be providing a car in the back of the procession to hopefully keep other cars from entering the procession. Also use your horn liberally as you're going through the intersections. Please do not speak or text on your cellular phone while driving to a cemetery. This time I'd like to invite the family members, the, the sons-in-law, daughter-in-law, grandchildren, to please come forward to serve as pallbearers as we escort the casket of Philip C. Zagon from the chapel. Then you may return to your cars. Please rise.